been genius, I thought. Okay, today, renal physiology. We're going to continue with what we uh, were discussing in, in uh, lab today. <clears throat> Primordial sea oceans of nephrology. Just to take a boom. All right. So, uh, Hippocrates was uh, arguably the first nephrologist. Uh, he was uh, one of the things that he was known for uh, was founding the science of uroscopy. Uh, and what this means is the inspection of urine. What he would do, have I said this in here already? No. Okay. What he would do is <clears throat> uh, have his patients urinate into a flask of some sort and he would inspect the urine and try to diagnose disease uh, from this uh, inspection. Was it bubbly? Did it smell bad? What did it look like? What color was it? Uh, uh, swirl it around. How viscous was it? Take a sip. What did it taste like? You knew that was coming. Yeah. Um, and in fact, drinking the urine was where he uh, derived the terms diabetes mellitus and diabetes uh, insipidus. Um, so diabetes itself, uh, there, there are um, these two very different categories, diabetes mellitus and insipidus. They uh, refer to uh, one of the symptoms of uh, either of these diseases, which is uh, diuresis or uh, extreme urination in the untreated case. People with diabetes mellitus, there's two different types of diabetes mellitus and then diabetes insipidus is its own thing. But people with diabetes mellitus, uh, they have a difficult time uh, uh, absorbing glucose into their cells, right? Uh, into their, their muscle cells, into their liver and whatever other cells. Uh, and because of this, they have abnormally high blood glucose levels. And um, we reach, your, your kidneys reach what's called renal threshold. The concentration of the glucose is so high that uh, glucose begins to appear in your urine. So when you uh, take a sip of a urine with a, from a person who's having a, uh, an acute, untreated diabetes mellitus, their urine was sweet. Uh, mellitus means sweet. Uh, like mellifluous is a sweet tune. Um, and diabetes insipidus, however, was not as uh, tasty. It was insipid or bitter urine, uh, not uh, demonstrating the presence of, um, uh, not demonstrating the presence of uh, glucose in the urine. So, <clears throat> um, Galen was the first person to uh, identify the kidneys as being uh, the source of the urine. And, you know, I, I've talked about how the Romans had this proscription against uh, human dissection or experimentation on humans, uh, which is probably good because this dude was pretty hardcore. Uh, there was no such problem with uh, doing this to animals, and this guy... Uh, went for it and um, would uh, open up uh, the, the posterior compartment of uh, apes and clamp their ureters, clamp their ureters, watched the kidneys uh, swell uh, from uh, the, the buildup of the urine and then surmised that it was actually the kidneys that were producing the urine. Way to go, Galen. Um, moving uh, forward... Uh, I have here a picture of Dr. Uh, no, I have a picture of uh, these, these uroscopists continuing Hippocrates' tradition. So you were ill, whatever was wrong with you, you'd go to a, uh, some sort of uh, doctor in, uh, in late medieval uh, and early Renaissance Europe, and they would have you... Uh, urinate in a flask, they'd look at it and, and do the whole business. Uh, this guy named Dr. Thomas Bryan uh, blew the whistle on it, though. Uh, I thought this was 
pretty amusing, in his uh, tract that he wrote in 1655 called The Piss Prophet. I'll read it to you, the, the title page here. Wherein are newly discovered the old fallacies, deceit, and juggling of the piss pot science used by all those, whether quacks or empirics or other methodical physicians who pretend knowledge of the diseases by the urine in giving judgment of the same. Uh, so he... he uh, wipes away the, um, the notion that uh, extensive disease can actually be diagnosed by inspecting the urine. And, you know, the truth was somewhere in between. The truth was in, in, in between. There's all kinds of uh, disease. Uh, the, the vast majority of disease is not going to be uh, diagnosable by uh, looking at and drinking your urine, although... Uh, the urine itself is uh, certainly uh, one window into uh, the diagnosis of disease, particularly with modern techniques. Um, I, I, I don't have a picture, and I should. I, I have a picture in a different slideshow. I'm going to talk about it because it's, this is just an amazing story. Uh, do you guys want to hear? Uh, I'm going to tell it to you because it's just such a great story uh, that relates to urine. Um, urine was instrumental in the discovery of phosphorus. So one of these uroscopists that you see in the middle, uh, was a guy named Hennig Brandt, who uh, I think he was Dutch. Um, Hennig Brandt, so uh, he was a uroscopist, but he was also an alchemist, and he was searching for the Philosopher's Stone. Well, what is the Philosopher's Stone, all of you uh, Harry Potter fans out there? What does that do for you? What is the Philosopher's Stone? You guys remember? Immortality, yep, absolutely, and one other thing it does you. What's, what's the point of, yeah, turn things to gold. What's the point of living forever if you don't have some, some spare change? So um, Hennig Brandt was an alchemist and a uroscopist. Anything that he could do to make a living. Uh, Hennig Brandt uh, needed a laboratory to do this. That t laboratory takes money. Uh, he actually wasn't a very good uroscopist, apparently, and... Uh, so his strategy was to marry into money. He married a wealthy uh, widow and uh, who was close to death and soon keeled over from, I don't know what causes, uh, and taking her money, built a um, laboratory and quickly remarried another wealthy widow who also soon uh, departed this, uh, this earth. Um, so after a series of two uh, rapid uh, windfalls. He built this lab, and with his stepsons that he uh, had also inherited, he sent them out to the uh, bars uh, around uh, his home to collect urine samples. And he was a uroscopist, and this is what he did. He collected uh, 1,500 gallons of urine from drunkards in the bars near his house. 1,500 gallons. Uh, Alan, how big is the pool at Colby? Do you know in gallons? Yeah, it's it, well, hundred. I don't know if it's hundreds of thousands, but it's 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 pretty large. Fifteen hundred gallons would probably put this room at least knee deep in in urine. All right, uh, and he let the urine uh, become fetid in the basement of his house uh, in his laboratory. Let it become fetid for, I don't know, a few months. And then he began <laughs> to boil it down. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm not sure <laughs> that his stepsons were excited by this. Uh, went through this process of boiling it down. It became this honey uh, syrup and then like uh, basically flamed it on, uh, kept flaming it out and, and eventually boiled it down to this 1,500-gallon uh, uh, vat of putrid urine got condensed into like a, a uh, golf ball-sized wad of glowing white material, which turned out to be uh, white phosphorus. So uh, he was the first person to, uh, and it was glowing because it was phosphorescent, glow in the dark. Uh, so he... Uh, um, 
discovered phosphorus uh, that way because ph phosphorus obviously is uh, part of you know nucleotides uh, and, and other components in here, phosphates that are excreted. Uh, we talked about how phosphate was excreted uh, in the urine as part of calcium homeostasis. So there's plenty of phosphorus in your urine. Um, and that led to the advent of matches and explosives, all kinds of other fun stuff. Hennig Brunt, one of these guys. He was one of these guys. Fun story. Uh, all right. This guy, Richard Bright, on the right-hand side, you see here, um, he <clears throat> uh, was the first person to identify uh, kidney disease um, in 1827. And uh, he uh, showed that kidney disease uh, was related to proteinuria or the presence of proteins in the urine. Normally, proteins are not present in your urine, but they are there in a damaged nephron or a damaged uh, kidney. And uh, what he called dropsy. Dropsy uh, in the 19th century was the word they used to describe edema, extreme swelling. So a person who's in kidney failure, you see this woman here, she is swelled up uh, be basically because she cannot remove any of the fluid from her body. Her interstitial uh, compartment between her cells is uh, full of fluid. She's in acute kidney failure and probably not long for the earth at that point. Um, so anyways, in, in, in identifying uh, the, that three-way connection there, between kidney failure, protein in your urine, and this uh, and this swelling. This was the beginning of modern nephrology. Uh, glomerulonephritis, uh, or uh, an inflammation of the nephron, uh, the, the glomerulus in your nephron, uh, for a you know up until uh, World War One was known as Bright's disease. Uh, so this this guy was Scottish. He was at the University of Edinburgh. All right, so another, another interesting uh, time point in the, in the study of uh, renal physiology was 1909. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons you can, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of unintentional uh, reasons and there are a lot of also stupid things you can do uh, to hurt your kidneys. And um, so kidney failure, as I had said, had been known for quite a long time from, uh, from Dr. Bright. Uh, in 1909, they tried to um, transplant the first kidney, the first organ transplant. And it happened uh, in a human in France, and they used an animal kidney. Um, I mean, on microscopic uh, inspection histologically and uh, macroscopically, uh, the gross anatomy of a porcine kidney is not really any different than a human. So the thought was, uh, if you take that animal kidney and stick it in a human, uh, perhaps it'll work. But of course, there was tissue rejection. Um, and this is uh, because of the major uh, histocompatibility complex. So cells that are self have proteins that are uh, on uh, antigens that are presented on these MHC uh, pedestals, these basically these platforms on the surface of your cell, uh, that the immune system can recognize as the self or not the self. And if uh, it doesn't recognize it as self, it gets destroyed. So um, in 1954, however, and there, I'm skipping a lot. There was a lot of different steps in between 09 and 54. But in 1954, this guy down here, Joseph Murray, um, who I, I actually think he was Canadian. Uh, that's not just me projecting something onto his happy disposition there. But um, yeah, I, he, was at, he was here in Boston, though. Um, and he, he performed the first successful uh, kidney transplant. And uh, the way that this worked was he used uh, monozygotic uh, kidneys, meaning that he had these two twins right here, these identical twins. I think they were the Herrick twins. Uh, one of them, I don't know which in that picture, they are identical. Uh, one of them is uh, in acute kidney distress and the other has perfectly fine kidneys. So he took 
one kidney out of uh, the healthy twin and put it into uh, the, the kidney, uh, into the body of the other. Um, the two of them in that one picture there, so the picture to the left is an actual photo from that uh, groundbreaking surgery. And then a uh, picture on the right, uh, upper right-hand corner there's the two of them looking at the first dialysis machine. They were also the first people to try dialysis, uh, which is a process whereby your blood is removed uh, incrementally from the body, filtered by a machine outside of the body, and then returned uh, to the body. Okay. So that's all the history. We'll go on and on about that, I guess. Uh, some of the functions, of, we, we've gone through the anatomy, uh, some of the functions of the urinary system. Well, obviously, uh, it's for excretion, right? The uh, excretion of uh, different waste products. That's the principal uh, purpose of the urinary system. And then elimination of fluid waste, right? So the storage and elimination of fluid waste, storage in the bladder and, and eventual elimination. Uh, but then, um, importantly, the kidneys are involved in a number of homeostatic processes. Uh, we've already talked about uh, the role of the kidneys in uh, calcium homeostasis and uh, maintenance of, of bone integrity, but it's also involved in uh, maintaining blood pressure as uh, a function of plasma volume, right? So uh, because you are able to uh, your, your excreting fluid, that's going to have a, a direct impact on plasma volume, which again uh, will have uh, a consequence towards blood pressure. Uh, there's a couple hormones that regulate that, uh, erythropoietin and renin. We'll I'll talk about those just a bit. Um, and then uh, there is solute concentration, uh, specifically calcium, uh, under the control of calcitriol. It helps to stabilize pH in the blood uh, via its, uh, its control of hydrogen ion concentration and, and carbonate um, and, and uh, the osmolarity of the blood uh, via uh, control of other uh, ions, uh, such as sodium, for example. If you uh, have too much sodium in the body, you can go through a process of naturesis, which is the removal of sodium from the body via the urine. And then uh, finally, there is some detoxification of the blood by elimination of water-soluble toxins that have specific transporters that enable uh, their elimination uh, from the body. So a lot of, a lot of complex functions around the kidneys. Ki kidneys are pretty central uh, to the, the broad uh, home homeostasis and physiology of the body. All right, so we've already kind of gone through all of this in lab. I'm not going to recap it, uh, really. Uh, but the point, the reason I kept this slide in here is I just wanted to point out, uh, yesterday I talked about 25% of the blood being in your lungs. Well, there's 25% of it, 25% uh, of your cardiac output goes through the kidneys. That's uh, a little over a liter of blood per minute, a little over a liter of blood per minute. So your heart pumps, you know, at rest probably five, five liters of blood in a minute, and a little over a liter goes through the kidneys. So the kidneys get a tremendous amount of uh, your cardiac output. Um, and this is essentially because uh, if you compare, and this is maybe a little bit uh, esoteric, but if you compare the cross-sectional area of the renal artery compared to the volume of the organ that it supplies, uh, the uh, kidneys get the lion's share. Uh, really, that ratio is, is probably the highest in the body. All right. So let's look a little bit closer at the nephron itself. This is, this is the business end of a kidney. And we're gonna, I'm going to uh, remind you of the anatomy just a little bit. And, and I'm going to give you an overview of the functions of some of these, uh, of these regions. And then we're going to walk through them in a little more detail.
Uh, nephrology, you know, the, the, the function of the nephron is actually really sophisticated. And I'm not going to be able to go into everything on uh, any kind of molecular scale. Uh, but I'll give you a kind of a taste of it. All right. Without, uh, that's, that's metaphorical. This is no, we're post uroscopy here. Um, all right. Uh, the first part of the nephron is the glomerulus, or the, I should say, the renal corpuscle. Um, and this is uh, where we produce what's called filtrate. Blood is going to come in through the afferent arteriole uh, and pass through the knot of capillaries called the glomerulus, and blood will then pass out through the efferent arteriole. Um, in, the blood in the glomerulus, um, there are going to be, we'll see, there's going to be these uh, pores, uh, fenestrations in the epithelium of the capillary, and then these filtration slits between uh, the pedicels of the, the visceral uh, epithelium that's laying on top of it, so that only um, water and small solutes are going to be able to be filtered out of the blood, right? Only water and small solutes, small solutes being like ions and you know, like sodium or something and, uh, and sugar like glucose or what have you, amino acids. That kind of stuff is going to get filtered uh, out of the blood. And then all of the, the like formed elements, the proteins, the, the you know, blood cells, all of that stuff is going to continue to pass out of the glomerulus into the efferent arterial. Meanwhile, all the filtrate uh, is going to enter uh, the urinary, is going to exit the renal corpuscle via the uh, proximal convoluted tubule and enter uh, the tubular system of the nephron. Um, so the first, the first part of that is the proximal convoluted tubule. And the principal job of the proximal convoluted tubule is uh, the most important job uh, of any of it, and that is to resorb as much water and important solutes as possible. All right, so a lot of this is going to be active. Uh, it's going to require some ATP. So again, it's going to be the resorption of water and, uh, and all important ions and organic nutrients that were filtered out. After the uh, PCT, it goes into the descending limb of uh, the nephron loop, and it's also called the thin limb. Uh, and then there's uh, this thick limb. So uh, the descending thin limb uh, resorbs water, and the thick limb uh, resorbs solutes. And what this is driving is called countercurrent multiplication. Uh, and this is essentially that the fluid is going down uh, the tube this way and going up the tube this way. So there's a directional gradient that's being established here, and we'll, we'll go through it in detail. But uh, one of these is going to be active, and then it's going to drive passively the other, uh, the other process by uh, creating a concentration gradient that is going to drive diffusion of the water. We'll see how that works in a bit. So the nephron loop is pretty ingenious structure. Uh, and then uh, we emerge from the nephron loop into the distal convoluted tubule. And uh, this is where the things that didn't get uh, excreted, toxins that we want out of our blood but didn't get filtered, are going to be actively uh, filtered out, if, if possible. All right. So all kinds of uh, whatever pharmaceuticals or drugs or toxins or ions that uh, we still want to get rid of, that um, whatever. Uh, the thing about the, the, the DCT is uh, it swings back near the glomerulus. And this is like a quality control. Uh, checkpoint, all right, where the properties of that fluid, the properties of uh, the tubular fluid at this point are, um, are uh, 
coming back towards the juxtaglomerular complex are going to be in uh, contact with the beginning of that process. So we can kind of get, the, the nephron gets a sense of what's happened in the PCT and the, and the loop of Henle. Uh, and then you can have variable, uh, variable uh, adjustments to the uh, tubular fluid. Maybe you're going to resorb some more water. Maybe it's not concentrated enough. Uh, or sodium, calcium, uh, blah, 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 et cetera. Uh, the, the distal convoluted tubule is going to be under uh, the hormonal, hormonal control, which we'll talk about in a bit. Then it enters, uh, leaves the nephron at that point via the connecting tubule and enters the collecting system uh, into a collecting duct. And there's going to be, uh, the collecting system is also uh, going to be, uh, have variable functionality uh, depending upon the specific needs um, of the body at the time. So you can absorb more water or less, various uh, uh, ions, particularly uh, potassium and, and sodium, of course. And then uh, this is also where we do a lot of the pH adjustment uh, by, uh, by controlling hydrogen ion and carbonate uh, excretion or or not. Um, okay, so that's an overview. Let's let's walk through it. Uh, there's a scanning uh, EM of the renal, uh, the glomerulus in the renal corpuscle, and pretty amazing thing if you ask me. Uh, yeah, they're about 200 micrometers in diameter. Um, 150 to 250, uh, so not very big, but big enough to see under the microscope. Um, the thing you can appreciate from here is how convoluted, uh, how, how tortuous the capillary knot is that forms the glomerulus. I have no idea how you would get an image like that. That's remarkable to me. All right, so here is a diagram, a cartoon sort of mimicking the one that I showed in the lecture uh, today. Uh, and the way this works is you have blood coming in via the afferent arterial. Uh, blood passes through the glomerulus, and uh, the filtrate passes out of the fenestration uh, slits between the pedicels, the filtration slits and the and the and the perforations in the capillary epithelium. Uh, that capsular fluid that is then in the capsular space passes out of the renal corpuscle via the uh, urinary pole on the other end and enters into the proximal convoluted tubule. You guys following this? This is pretty straightforward. Okay. Uh, sometimes students have a hard time wrapping their heads around the uh, the anatomy here, but the epithelium of the capsule, the glomerular epithelium or capsular uh, epithelium is uh, what forms the outer margin of Bowman's capsule. And then right here on the, on the uh, vascular pole, uh, it, it sort of merges into this visceral uh, epithelium, visceral epithelium, or glomerular, also known as the glomerular epithelium. And these cells specifically are called podocytes uh, because they have feet on them, like I said in lecture, in lab, and uh, feet of them have little toes called pedicels. The pedicels interdigitate, um, like, so I said this in lab, but like your hands would be podocytes uh, with the fingers being pedicels. And imagine that you were at the beach and you took your hands, you, you interlaced your fingers like this, and you went to the water and scooped up some sand from the water and then lifted it out of the water. The sand would remain in your hand, not be able to pass through the, the slits between your hands, but the water would, would find a way through. Okay? And that's, that's essentially uh, what we have here. 
So there's the, the podocytes uh, with their pedicels, these little fingers that have these slits in them. And that's what gives it this sort of like orange or red uh, zigzaggy striping pattern. That's just the, the slits in between the adjacent uh, podocytes. Um, so uh, lastly, if you were to look at a cross section of uh, uh, a cross section of these uh, cells, I didn't talk about this anatomy in the lab, but uh, so here we're going to take a cross section and we look at it uh, in between two adjacent. Uh, so here are the, the capillaries, and we see the the fenestrations, the pores, uh, and then we see this network of pedicels and filtration slits here. Uh, but in between two adjacent uh, uh, capillaries, there's going to be a specialized cell called a mesangial cell. Uh, M-E-S-A-N-G-I-A-L, mesangial, mesangial cell. Uh, and we'll talk about them in a bit. Mesangial cells are going to be uh, able uh, through their um, their contraction to uh, modify the volume, the aperture, the diameter of uh, the capillary inside the, the renal uh, corpuscle, and thus are going to be able to affect uh, the capillary blood flow. One other, the last thing I want to point out is just the juxtaglomerular complex. I talked about it. Here it is, juxtaglomerular complex is made of two parts. The macula densa, it's this thicker, denser uh, patch of cells in the distal convoluted tubule that has wrapped itself up here and inserted itself between the afferent and efferent arterioles. And then the sort of interstitial cells that you see there, which we call juxtaglomerular cells. Uh, I know it's confusing that we have two words that both start with juxta in the kidney uh, that mean kind of different things. Um, there's the juxtamedullary nephron. That's a nephron that's uh, right, is juxtaposed to the, uh, to the medulla. And then juxtaglomerular cells, uh, they're juxtaposed to the glomerulus. So this juxtaglomerular complex is uh, going to be... It, can be considered to be endocrine tissue. This is endocrine tissue that uh, we'll talk about a bit uh, later. All right, so to uh, belabor the perhaps at this point uh, obvious, but uh, I'm gonna talk about how a filter works. So um, we zoom in on a little portion of this uh, glomerulus. Here's the lumen of the uh, capillary. And then here, out here, this would be capsular space. So inside the Bowman's capsule. Uh, and so this is space that's going to communicate with the uh, convoluted tubule. And here, the, the darker red is meant to be the uh, capillary epithelium. And we see the little fenestrations here, the, the pores uh, in between it. And then laying on top of that are the pedicels that are interdigitated with their little filtration slits in between them. So uh, the way this works is blood comes in, here's a bunch of blood, and water can pass through, and small solids can pass through, but uh, proteins and obviously bigger things like cells, blood cells, are not going to be able to uh, pass out. The overall filtration pressure that it feels is about 10 millimeters of mercury. And we're going to, I think I keep the slide that breaks that down. Um, but that pressure, the exact value of that pressure is really important. Because uh, if it gets too high, you can, it can lead to kidney damage. All right. So is there anything else on that slide I want to say? I don't think so. All right, more pretty pictures. Uh, no unique point to make with this slide, but pretty amazing uh, picture where you can see the actual 
pedicels that are interleaved with one another, forming those filtration slits. So this is the surface of the glomerulus. You're looking at podocytes. Um, and I guess this would be, yeah, this would be a podocyte. These would be the pedicels coming off of them. All right, yeah, here are the forces involved. So, um, the blood pressure, uh, the blood hydrostatic pressure that is uh, an average uh, that is in the glomerulus that's pushing the filtrate out is about 60 millimeters of mercury. However, it's fighting against a couple uh, of of uh, contradictory forces. There is uh, the force of the fluid that's already in the capsule, right? So the capsular fluid is about 20 millimeters of mercury. Um, and uh, there, the other force that we're working against is an os the osmotic pressure of the blood versus uh, the, the filtrate, all right? Because there are a bunch of solutes that cannot pass through the filtration slits, there is going to be a net uh, osmotic pressure of about negative 30 uh, millimeters of mercury, also opposing uh, the direction of the blood flow. All right. So if you add all that up, 60 going one way, 30 and 20 going the other way, uh, th there's a net force of about 10 millimeters of mercury uh, heading out um, from the, the, the capillaries towards the capsular space. Um, if you have uh, too high of a blood pressure, this is going to make what are extremely delicate capillaries prone to rupture. Okay? If you have chronic high blood pressure, uh, your kidneys are uh, you're, you are liable for kidney damage and you can rupture these uh, glomerular capillaries. Uh, if that happens, you uh, get uh, nephrosclerosis or scarring of the kidneys um, and uh, that leads to an, it can start an inflammatory cascade that can, lead to atherosclerosis of uh, the, the renal vasculature. If that happens, uh, you get some, you go into kidney failure, you get some pretty unhappy looking. So this is uh, acute nephrosclerosis right here. So you can see that not, you can understand why the kidneys not only are important in obviously important uh, in regulating blood pressure uh, in terms of their uh, unique relationship with blood volume and the ability to remove uh, different solutes and, and fluid from the body, but uh, it, the kidneys are also uniquely prone to abnormalities in the blood pressure. Okay, so um, the amount of uh, filtrate that you're going to produce is uh, dependent on, on what's called the glomerular filtration rate. All right, and there are a, a few different ways we can control this glomerular filtration rate. Uh, there's uh, an auto regulation, a local uh, auto regulation. It can also be uh, under either endocrine or neuronal control. So if it's under uh, endocrine control, there's uh, a number of uh, hormones that are gonna be called into play. This um, control is initiated by the, the kidneys. And then if it's neuronal control, it's obviously uh, autonomics. You don't think to yourself uh, volitionally that, oh wow, I, I need to produce more urine, uh, better wake the kidneys up that is a part of the sympathetic uh, innervation to the kidneys. So three, three ways. There's uh, a 
an auto-regulatory uh, local mechanism, and then a uh, endocrine and a sympathetic ANS uh, mode of control. And though I mean, these this paradigm is pretty standard, right? To, for a lot of different organs, you're going to see this same uh, the same pattern. All right, so. Um, Let's talk about the juxtaglomerular complex and uh, the protein, the, the hormones that are going to be uh, produced by it. Uh, and I already had mentioned that the juxtaglomerular complex is a uh, endocrine structure. Uh, the first one that uh, can be produced by uh, the juxtaglomerular complex is erythropoietin, and uh, this happens when the, uh, the ambient level of oxygen entering the glomerulus drops. Some chemoreceptors in the juxtaglomerular cells uh, are going to begin to produce erythropoietin, and erythropoietin is going to travel through the blood, go to uh, the red marrow or the spleen, uh, and stimulate that tissue to uh, begin producing more red blood cells uh, so that we can transport more uh, oxygen, right? Um, and then another uh, hormone that uh, we're going to uh, talk about a little bit more than erythropoietin is called renin. And um, the job of renin is to regulate the blood pressure. Uh, and renin is likely produced uh, by the uh, cells of the macula densa. Okay, so um, here's the, the auto-regulatory uh, feedback of uh, the homeostasis uh, system for maintaining uh, the appropriate glomerular filtration rate. So let's imagine that we start at normal and then for some reason uh, the glomerular filtration rate drops. This is going to give us a drop in the, the amount of filtrate that's produced and a, and a drop in the amount of urine that's produced. So um, the juxtaglomerular complex is going to sense that and is going to uh, cause a few different effects. Uh, the first is going to be the dilation of the afferent arterioles. Um, and what, it, what is that going to achieve if we dilate the afferent arterioles? More blood is going to come into the, uh, into the renal corpuscle. If more blood's coming in, then uh, we are probably going to be increasing that uh, blood hydrostatic pressure that the glomerulus uh, experiences. Uh, next would be the contraction of the mesangial cells. Um, and if we contract the mesangial cells, those are those contractile cells I said that were adjacent to the capillaries, that's going to reduce the cross-sectional volume, uh, the cross-sectional area, I guess, of uh, the capillaries. And uh, by re reducing that volume uh, in the actual glomerular uh, capillaries, you're going to be increasing, uh, also increasing that uh, blood hydrostatic pressure that's forcing the filtrate out. Lastly, we're going to constrict the efferent arterioles. So now uh, we have more blood coming in, and it's working against a higher pressure uh, to get out of the glomerulus, and thus it's going to increase uh, the hydrostatic pressure. So the way to think about this, it would be like uh, you have a garden hose, and uh, like a drip line or something like that, or a slip and slide or something like that, but a garden hose that maybe that has... Uh, some perforations in it. You turn on the garden hose and there's a bunch of water pouring out the end of the garden hose and there's like small little jets of water coming out of the hose, right? 
Uh, we want to increase the, the uh, rate at which the water is coming out of those little perforations. So what, what can we do? We can either uh, crank up the hose and send more water through the hose uh, on, on the uh, front end or on, or on the back end, I mean. And on the front end, we could put our thumb over the opening to the hose and increase the pressure in the hose, right? Um, and so that, that putting your thumb over the end of the hose is like constricting the efferent arterioles. Dilating the afferent arterioles is like turning the, the nozzle up on the hose. And then contraction of the mesangial cells, what would that be like? That would be, there's not a really good metaphor for that, but it would be like uh, somehow compressing the diameter of the hose uh, to make uh, the same amount of water in a smaller space. So you'd be increasing the pressure uh, of the water that would be shooting out holes. Um, and then when that happens, you're going to increase the glomerular blood pressure, uh, which will restore you to normal. Um, so your glomerular filtration rate is about uh, 125 milliliters per minute. That is about, um, you know, 125 milliliters. That's like a little juice uh, glass full of filtrate per minute. Um, so that ends up being 180 liters per day. You guys remember how many liters of serum I said were in your body? Like three, right? Not, not that much serum in your body. So your uh, kidneys filter 180 liters per day. Um, obviously, if we didn't... Uh, resorb that somehow, you we, we would quickly die. 99% uh, of, actually low, higher than 99% of that is resorbed uh, via the convoluted tubules. Um, and of the blood that makes it into uh, the glomerulus, about 10% of that fluid uh, entering the kidneys uh, leaves the bloodstream and enters the capsular space. And, uh, but 99% of that 10% is then resorbed. Does that make sense? Okay. So here is uh, a negative feedback uh, loop on the other side. So we talked about a dropping uh, glomerular filtration rate. Uh, here's the other half of it. So we have a high GFR. There is a rapid flow of filtrate into the renal tubules. We're producing a lot of fluid. Uh, in this case, the macula densa at the juxtaglomerular complex will uh, sensate that. And it's going to uh, produce uh, some paracrine secretions, which are going to have, this is the autoregulation, the in situ regulation, uh, which will constrict the afferent arterial, sort of turning the nozzle down on the hose, right? Like pushing less fluid into the hose. Uh, this will then bring down the glomerular, glomerular filtration rate. You could probably streamline these slides into a single one, but okay, everybody good? All right, so in terms of considering uh, the homeostasis of uh, our, our water uh, maintenance, uh, the, the blood pressure and the osmolarity of the blood in terms of sodium and potassium, uh, there are uh, some major hormones, there's some minor hormones, and there are some critical enzymes. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of this. I'm not going to talk about any of this in full detail, and much of it is not going to get any mention beyond being on this list here. Because, uh, yeah, you could, you could spend, I mean, you could spend many, many lectures talking about this. Uh, the major hormones are angiotensin II, uh, which is a cleavage product of angiotensinogen, originally, aldosterone, and antidiuretic hormone, ADH. 
Um, there's this long list of other minor, minor hormones that atrial natura, naturetic peptide, cortisol, ACTH, and all, all these, there's a lot of different minor hormones that I'm not going to get a chance to go into even remotely. Uh, but then there's a few enzymes uh, that are also going to be important. Uh, we've already talked about renin a little bit. Um, and then the other one that's important is ACE, uh, angiotensin converting. So angiotensin converting enzyme is going to be important for, uh, for activating angiotensin 2. All right, so those are the major hormones, angiotensin 2, aldosterone, antidiuretic hormone, and then renin and ACE are both going to be uh, important enzymes in this process. So let's, let's look at this a little bit. Um, <clears throat> there are really four, uh, there are four ways in which uh, the homeostasis of sodium, potassium, and water uh, can be affected. And we'll get to the renal system last. I'm going to just touch on the other three first. First, there's the GI system. Uh, we eat sodium and potassium, and we drink water. So the absorption of fluid by the GI tract is an important component in uh, the balance of sodium and potassium and water in the body. There is a small amount of water that is returned to the GI tract. Our feces is not utterly desiccated, uh, but uh, on balance, you know, we obviously uh, consume more fluid through our GI tract than we lose. Um, the next is the endocrine system. And there are a number of hormones in the endocrine system that uh, are going to help mediate the homeostasis of these three components. Uh, I'm, I'm showing the, uh, the suprarenal gland, which is going to be the source of a number of them. And I'm also showing the hypothalamus and the pituitary, uh, which are also uh, sort of at the top of the endocrine pyramid. Um, we'll, we'll graze that in, in a slide or more. I'll expand that in a bit. But that has an important uh, impact on the sodium, potassium, and water uh, balance in the body. Then there is um, the intracellular space. So there's a huge amount of our total body fluid uh, exists in, I've already shown you that diagram uh, earlier in the, in the month, uh, showing the uh, fluid that's in the intracellular space. Uh, and we are well aware of the importance of the uh, sodium and potassium dynamics across the membrane. So uh, there can be various shifts, transmembrane shifts, uh, that can have an effect on sodium, potassium, and water. <clears throat> so not, uh, because so much fluid in the to of the total is contained within the intracellular space, it doesn't take radical shifts in concentrations uh, to create uh, significant effects on the overall homeostasis of water, potassium, and sodium. And then lastly, the renal system, which is why we're here. There's filtration uh, at the glomerulus, and then there's resorption in the convoluted tubules. All right. So here's a, here is uh, a definition, a vocab word, axis. So all of this, the water, the sodium, and the potassium homeostasis uh, are part of um, a homeostatic axis for blood pressure. So we have these blood pressure homeostatic axes. And what does that even mean? An axis is a sequential set of direct influences and feedback mechanisms that link closely related endocrine glands and target organs. So this is to say uh, there are, there, there's a sequence of uh, mechanisms, organs and mechanisms uh, that lead to the desired homeostatic uh, outcome, and 
that more than one axis can run in parallel uh, to another. All right, so the two axes that we're going to talk about are the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis, the RAA axis, and uh, another called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, or HPA axis. So this is the way uh, the nephrologists talk about it, the RAA axis and the HPA axis, the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis and hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Um, who uh, of those who looked ahead at the slides, was this slide in there? Uh, did anybody look ahead? This one was? Yeah, good. Okay. All right. So let's go through the RAA axis first. And we'll walk through it nice and slow. So if we have a decrease in uh, the renal perfusion pressure, a decrease in the glomerular filtration rate, right? So there's a, low, a drop in the blood pressure in uh, the glomerulus. Uh, that's going to stimulate the production of renin, all right, at the juxtaglomerular complex. You're going to stimulate the production of, of renin. Renin, uh, so there's a protein called angiotensinogen. Uh, it's a, what's called a zymogen. I've used that word be before here. Um, it, it's, it's just a, uh, it's a precursor, a non-active uh, precursor. So renin uh, converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Um, angiotensin 1 circulates through the body, ends up at uh, the lungs, which produce uh, ACE, the angio angiotensin converting enzyme. ACE then turns angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Uh, <clears throat> angiotensin 2 is uh, going to circulate through the body uh, and lead to the production of aldosterone in various endocrine tissues. All right, so all of this, this RAA axis, is simply a drop in the blood pressure in the glomerulus leads to renin. Renin converts, uh, activates, leads to a, a series of things that activates uh, angiotensin, which then leads to the production of aldosterone. The, what we're looking for is aldosterone, all right? And uh, angiotensin converting enzyme is, is part of that. You guys see this cascade that we, we have here, the, the axis? All right, so let's, let's look at it. This is kind of the same thing, but a, little, a few more details have been added, and we've, and we've closed the homeostatic loop in this diagram. So we're going to start by uh, disturbing the glomerular filtration rate. We're going to reduce the renal perfusion pressure. So there's going to be a, a drop in the blood pressure uh, at the glomerulus, um, could be due to a drop in blood volume or a uh, drop in systemic blood pressure, or maybe your renal artery has been blocked. That's a problem. Um, and, uh, maybe there's a drop in the osmotic concentration of the tubular fluid at the mac macula densa. All these things, uh, can lead to this, uh, disturbance in, uh, homeostasis. So that's going to lead to the release of renin through the action of the what? What is it that uh, is going to notice that there's a problem and, and lead to the production of renin? Yeah, so <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, just, I'm trying to keep you guys on the toes because I see, feel like I drone on about it. But so we have renin that's getting produced in response to a drop in the glomerular filtration rate, what part of the kidney is doing that? The juxtaglomerular complex. So uh, renin gets released. There can be other things that lead to it, however. We can have, I said that there was, uh, there was autonomic 
input that can, so neuronal input, we can have uh, sympathetic uh, input that can stimulate the release of renin. Um, <clears throat> renin is going to uh, go through, uh, that. it's going to initiate that RAA axis cascade, which leads to the activation of angiotensin. Uh, and there's going to be a series of uh, things. There's a, actually probably a bunch of arrows here that leads to the elevation of blood pressure and blood volume. So let's look at uh, those series of arrows uh, on this side. Renin converts angiotensinogen, uh, which is a proenzyme. Uh, that's what it says there. It's 453 amino acids long. It gets uh, cleaved into the business portion, which is only 10 amino acids long. It's really a peptide. Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, a bioactive peptide that uh, is then going to have two more uh, regulatory amino acids cleaved off by uh, ACE at the lungs, the angiotensin converting enzyme at the lungs. So angiotensin 2 is going to have a number of effects, and this is, this is the thing. So the first thing it's going to do is affect the hypothalamus, uh, which is going to make you thirsty. It's going to make you thirsty. Uh, angiotensin is going to uh, affect the uh, diencephalon, and you are going to say, geez, I would like some water. You want to take on uh, more fluid. You want to restore blood uh, volume by drinking, by drinking water. That will, uh, it's one thing that can help elevate the blood pressure. The next thing that angiotensin uh, 2 can do is achieve vasoconstriction. So it's going to make the blood vessels clamp down. It's going to, uh, and we already know from the cardiovascular chapter that vasoconstriction leads to an increase in blood pressure. And then the last thing that happens, uh, angiotensin can uh, lead to the production of aldosterone uh, at the suprarenal gland. Aldosterone is um, going to have effects on the convoluted tubules and lead to the retention of sodium uh, and water. So you may say, why sodium? Why do we want to retain sodium, would you think? If you have low blood pressure, uh, why is it better to uh, retain more sodium? Yeah, yeah. If you have more sodium on board, uh, there's going to be an osmotic pressure that's going to drive water back into the body. Good. Um, okay. You guys follow all that? Okay, good. Um, so here is uh, how this uh, plays out. Uh, on a piece-by-piece -piece basis in the actual nephron. Um, so let's start at the glomerulus at the top. Um, we're going to have a drop in the renal blood pressure, uh, the perfusion pressure. That's going to uh, lead the juxtaglomerular cells uh, to produce renin. Um, and then... Uh, We're going to have a uh, increase in the blood pressure there, which will lead to more filtrate. Then, uh, in the proximal convoluted tubules, angiotensin uh, angiotensin two will stimulate uh, an increase in the resorption of sodium and carbonate. All right. So this is going to, like uh, Maria uh, pointed out, this is going to lead to an increase in osmotic pressure drawing water back into the body and uh, shoring up the blood pressure. Then, uh, uh, where, where some other hormonal effects. Okay, yeah, down in the collecting duct is where we have the effects of aldosterone. So aldosterone is going to cause a, uh, a uh, exchange, an anti-transport, uh, of sodium for potassium. We're going to export potassium and import uh, sodium. And uh, 
and then likewise the uh, we're going to export uh, hydrogen ions and then reclaim that potassium that we lost uh, in uh, the other cells. So the specific names of the cells, the principal cells and the intercalated cells, you don't need to know uh, those names, but there are different types of cells in the collecting system. And essentially what we're, what we're doing, aldosterone is alkalizing the blood uh, and in so doing, uh, trying to maintain uh, uh, sodium and potassium levels. It's exporting uh, hydrogen ion. All right. So uh, this will lead to an increase in sodium uh, at the proximal convoluted tubule, and because of that, an increase in water resorption and, and blood pressure. And it's also going to uh, alkalize the blood and uh, make the serum pH go up. So that's the ultimate outcome of the RAA axis. All right. I haven't talked about the HPA axis yet at all, but... Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the loop of Henle and this whole idea of counter current multiplication. Um, so this is pretty interesting how this works, I think. Um, as the, uh, it, you know, I, I'm, I talk about it, I guess, from the perspective of the uh, flow of urine, but it may make more sense to talk about it backwards, uh, starting from the thick uh, ascending lip. So what happens over here is there are active transport, there are active transport uh, proteins that are burning ATP uh, and exporting sodium chloride. So we keep a net charge neutrality, it's both sodium and chloride. And, and as it exports the sodium chloride, it creates a concentration gradient, a concentration gradient throughout the tissue of the medulla. That concentration gradient drives the passive process of osmosis in the descending limb. So we're, we're paying, we're getting two for the price of one. We're paying to resorb uh, the sodium chloride but as a consequence, the water is passively following uh, on, the, on the descending because we're creating a, a concentration uh, gradient through the tissue. Does that make sense? So what, what, how do I explain it on the, on the slide here? Solute pumping at the ascending limb increases solute concentration in the descending limb, which accelerates solute pumping in the ascending. Same thing. Okay. Um, this is extremely effective. This is extremely effective. Uh, this, in particular, the loop of Henley, uh, the number that, they, that I, I found was that only about 15 to 20% of the initial volume of that filtrate that you're going to find at the glomerulus is able to make it past this. So we've already uh, resorbed about... 80 to 85 percent of the fluid. 99 uh, percent is what we, we need, and the rest of that has got to be at the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. All right. Uh, so uh, here is uh, the effect of antidiuretic hormone um, on on this latter portion of, uh, so this is from the other, uh, the other axis that I had talked about. Um, so antidiuretic uh, hormone is going to cause um, these proteins called aquaporins uh, to get uh, expressed, upregulated and expressed into uh, the membrane of the cells in the collecting duct. And uh, what aquaporin does is it's going to uh, enable the resorption of water as the tubular fluid passes down and becomes uh, urine. So in the, in the pro presence of ADH, antidiuretic hormone, uh, we go from a large volume of dilute urine to a small volume of concentrate. 
So here's uh, the, the process I just described of countercurrent multiplication. That's not actually what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is in the uh, distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. The presence of antidiuretic uh, enables these aquaporins to help resorb more water. Uh, it's also called vasopressin. You see that sometimes. All right, is there any other point I want to make? No. Okay. So these are uh, some important concepts here. The idea of transport maximum and the uh, idea of renal threshold. So uh, a transport maximum is the maximal rate of secretion or resorption of a substance by the renal, renal tubules. This is as fast as the, the nephron can move whatever it is that it's moving, either excretion or, uh, or resorption. Um, a related concept is the no notion of renal threshold. So transport maximum is a rate. It's think you're, so when you think about transport maximum, it's a certain amount of something excreted per minute or whatever, right? So it's some uh, amount of material per time. A renal threshold is, is an amount uh, of material per volume. It's looking at a concentration, a concentration maximum. So uh, specifically, it's the plasma concentration at which a specific compound or ion begins to appear in the urine. So this is going to vary from substance to substance. Um, I guess before I get into re renal threshold, I might as well walk through these diagrams. So here we are uh, below our transport maximum, and we have this black uh, protein up there whose job it is to take things that we had uh, filtered out of the blood uh, and put into the uh, into the filtrate, into the tubular fluid, and return them to the blood. And as we see that, that uh, protein uh, going around there, there are, open, uh, there are open spots. So it could be going faster. But at the transport maximum, it, every time it transports something uh, and, it's, and it's done, it is beginning a new transport uh, event. So it's at its capacity. Then above that rate, above uh, that rate, the amount that's being returned to the blood stays the same, but if there's a higher concentration in the blood, then we're going to uh, start to see the presence of some of that solute in the urine. Uh, and this happens in both directions. So there can be resorption in the top panels or secretion in the bottom panel. Um, right. So when you want to think about this in terms of what are the actual concentrations uh, that are going to lead uh, to uh, exceeding the transport max of uh, whatever, um, this is the renal threshold. And that renal threshold is going to vary depending upon the solute. All right. So glucose, for example, has 180 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, and uh, if you exceed that, if your blood glucose level is above 180, you get glycosuria. And uh, if that is the case, you maybe have diabetes mellitus, right? If that's the case, then uh, we're right here and glucose is beginning to appear in the urine, right? So that would be uh, perhaps this concentration here would be 180 milligrams per deciliter if we were talking about uh, glucose, or it would be 65 milligrams per deciliter if we were talking about most amino acids. So every amino acid is going to have a little bit different one because there are specific uh, transporters for different amino acids. Um, so amino acid, if you have a really protein-rich meal, so for example, you are paleo, and you're, you're going to eat, uh, you know, some steak and egg whites for, for dinner or whatever, 
uh, and nothing else, you can have uh, you can have a bit of a spike in amino acids in your blood, uh, and you exceed your transport maximum, exceed your renal threshold for that uh, for those amino acids. You go into what's called amino acid urea. Uh, it just means that you have amino acids appearing uh, in your urine. This is actually fairly common. Uh, the last word here that uh, I've, I used it once already today is naturesis. That is just uh, what happens when you have the appearance of sodium in your urine. All right. You guys get the idea of transport maximum and renal threshold? Yeah? No? Anyone? Okay. All right. So this is uh, kind of synthesizing a lot of this uh, into a single slide. Um, so <clears throat> we have, uh, we're trying to maintain the homeostasis of sodium, potassium, and water, which is going to maintain our, our blood pressure. And I talked about the role of the GI tract in absorbing sodium, potassium, and water. That is uh, going to be bolstering uh, each of those three components of the blood. The intracellular space, uh, likewise, uh, is going to be exchanging and different types of hormones that I'm not going to go into, uh, various catecholamines, the insulin, the effect of insulin on the, on, uh, on the cells, uh, can affect the, uh, can, can change the effect of the, uh, fluid and the, uh, osmolites in the intracellular space. And then lastly, here's the kidney. And the relationship of the kidney uh, with the blood pressure is a little complex, uh, as we've already seen. So uh, there is sodium, potassium, and water that is getting filtered out of the blood at the glomerulus in the kidney. All right, so that, and that's, that's this process, glomerular filtration coming out. Um, and some of that is going to pass into the urine. But each of those three things uh, is going to get resorbed to the, into the blood at variable rates uh, and under the control of different things. So first, let's consider uh, sodium. Uh, these natriuretic peptides that are produced by the heart, and what, we don't need to worry about that too much, but that's going to slow down uh, the resorption of sodium. But a number of things are going to uh, speed it up, and that's angiotensin II. Uh, we had talked about uh, that in the proximal convoluted tubule earlier. And then the effects of aldosterone and sometimes cortisol will also uh, accelerate the resorption of sodium in the distal. Uh, then considering uh, potassium, uh, aldosterone actually is going to slow resorption of potassium down, uh, but these two can also indirectly affect potassium, uh, I'm sorry, water resorption based upon uh, their effect, direct effect on sodium. So water is going to follow the sodium, which is under the control of these two hormones. And then lastly, uh, antidiuretic hormone has a direct effect, not an indirect effect, but has a direct effect on the absorption of water. Uh, by the production of the aquaporins that I showed you in that slide. All right, so this is, there's nothing new in this slide. This is just taking everything I've talked about so far today and sticking it uh, kind of on one slide for you. You guys following me? Who's, whose brains are leaking out their ears? Everybody good? No? <laughs> A little bit? Um, okay. Yeah. Complicated stuff. Keep the kidneys till the end because it's a lot. Uh, another summary slide. Uh, this is another summary slide, but we're looking at it this time from the perspective of the, uh, of the nephron. So uh, the blood enters the, the glomerulus. We get the filtration of the blood and the production of the tubular fluid which is going to go through the proximal convoluted tubule. We're going to resorb nutrients, resorb uh, water, 
It's going to go into the uh, descending and then ascending limb of the loop of Henle. The descending limb is going to have passive resorption osmosis, osmotic uh, resorption of water based upon a concentration gradient in the medulla that's established by active transport of sodium chloride uh, in the thick ascending uh, that is being powered by uh, ATP. Uh, and then finally, uh, I can't reach up there with my stick, but uh, the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct is going to fine tune that. First of all, it's going to check in with uh, the juxtaglomerular complex and initiate uh, various homeostatic controls, uh, the production of renin if it needs to, and uh, is going to uh, act accordingly to um, fine-tune the composition of the tubular fluid, resorb some more water, uh, and, uh, and adjust the osmolites as well. Uh, this is under the control of the antidiuretic said in the last slide. So then all of this fluid and all of this sodium that has been uh, put into the interstitial space, right, between all these cells, it's all going to get absorbed by the vasa recta and returned to general circulation. Okay? So all that stuff that's being pulled out of the tubes is in an interstitial space that then uh, is picked up by these, these uh, peritubular capillaries. Yeah. Okay. We're getting close. So I'm going to let you guys out a little early today. But <clears throat> micturition is another word for urination. Um, and that just means uh, letting go of the fluid that's in your bladder. Uh, diuresis... Um, is micturition on a grand scale. So diuresis uh, um, denotes a larger volume of uh, urine production. And diuretics are um, compounds that are going to stimulate uh, diuresis. And you can use diuretics for a number of reasons. Maybe uh, you want to reduce blood volume or well, thereby blood pressure. Uh, maybe there's uh, extracellular fluid or interstitial fluid volume that needs to be uh, re reduced for some reason. Uh, these diuretics can achieve that. Um, there's a lot of different diuretics. Uh, there's, it's a huge... Uh, huge category of compounds with a lot of subcategories. Uh, and typically, uh, there's the way they're categorized is not structurally or exactly the mode of action, but it's, uh, it's more anatomically, like what part of the nephron are they targeting. So I put a couple examples up there. Uh, there's Furosemid uh, is a loop diuretic, and then torsamid is also a loop diuretic. And if you look, these two um, molecules do have some structural similarities. Uh, they have some structural similarities to them. Uh, but then here is a totally different, uh, a totally different diuretic. It's an aldosterone agonist, an aldosterone. Uh, mimetic called uh, spironolactone, spironolactone, and that is a uh, hormone structure that is you just looking at that you could probably guess that that's based originally on cholesterol, right? You take cholesterol and you modify it, you get that thing. Uh, aldosterone does not look tremendously dissimilar from that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we've talked about wastes a little bit, and I wasn't going to talk about this slide, and then this morning I decided I would talk about it, because it's, uh, it's good just to see what we're talking about. Um, there are really four types of nitrogenous wastes that you're going to find in your body. 
And we will talk about nitrogen balance a little bit tomorrow. Nitrogen balance being, uh, I guess tomorrow is my last real uh, data lecture that I'm giving you guys. But uh, nitrogen balance is really the nitrogen you take in versus the nitrogen you excrete, right? The nitrogen you excrete is, uh, takes one of these four forms. And um, they can either be ammonia or urea. Uh, and either of those things uh, comes from the breakdown of amino acids, which are, of course, from proteins. Um, the ammonia is, uh, can be excreted by the liver, no problem, but it can also be converted into urea uh, by uh, the liver um, to make it a little bit uh, more soluble. Uh, on the other hand, the other source of nitrogen that we find in the body is in the nucleic acids. Uh, so sometimes you need to break nucleic acids down and... Um, the catabolism of nucleic acids will give you either uric acid or uh, uh, creatinine, and uh, <clears throat> which can come from the creatine phosphate catabolism. So those are the, the major sources of nitrogen that you're going to find in your urine. Um, all right. So then this is probably my last uh, couple slides here. I'm going to talk about... Uh, diabetes mellitus a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to go into in, in this in depth. Uh, we, we could certainly have a whole, again, a whole lecture on this. But uh, type 1 diabetes is much less common. And so a lot of times people get this confused. They think that, oh, type 1 is diabetes insipidus and type 2 is diabetes mellitus. That is not the case. There is Diabetes insipidus, which is a totally unrelated thing to blood glucose that just is a thing where people are having extreme diuresis. And then diabetes mellitus um, is the inability to deal with uh, your blood glucose properly. Type 1 diabetes mellitus is uh, the pancreas just doesn't make the insulin that it needs. Um, and this is typically juvenile uh, onset, juvenile diabetes. Uh, it can start uh, very early uh, in a child's life or uh, in their teenage years or even uh, in college, but it's usually earlier onset. Um, and uh, type 1 diabetes uh, is, is difficult, but uh, it's manageable with uh, insulin pumps. They have uh, pumps that these people uh, can wear that can stabilize uh, their blood sugar and be responsive to their uh, needs throughout the day. Um, and then, uh, but this is only about 10% of the cases of diabetes out there. In fact, it's probably less than that. Um, yeah, I, I would actually, I don't know, but I would guess it would probably be 3 to 5% of people with diabetes have type 1. Type 2 diabetes is much more common, and this is called insulin-resistant diabetes, adult-onset uh, diabetes. So uh, type 2 diabetes is particularly, uh, the re you know, so I, I put these numbers up here, 10%, 90%. The reason for that, uh, those numbers have changed with time. Uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, has become much more of an epidemic in this country uh, as the diet in the United States has changed. Um, America has developed uh, quite a sweet tooth. Um, and that really started in the 70s when uh, this, there was sort of a, a, a perfect storm uh, hit the nutrition uh, the nutritional infrastructure of this country, a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, up until Richard Nixon, um, who was the president of the United States in the early 70s, there, there was uh, prices of sugar would vary widely. It would go up and down. And just like in ancient Rome, when uh, you know, the, the Romans were the first people to subsidize food, 
they, uh, they subsidized the uh, Sardinian and the Sicilian uh, grain harvest uh, so that uh, the price of bread would stabilize because you want, make, you want to make sure people can afford the food they eat or else you have unrest. Well, in the United States, it was the same thing, except for sugar. Sugar, uh, the, the price of sugar fluctuated wildly, and uh, Richard Nixon did not want uh, sugar to be a political issue any longer. So, uh, two other things happened that uh, presented themselves as a solution for his political problem. The first was that at, in the early 70s, 1970, I think, the uh, uh, researchers in Japan developed a way to extract fructose from corn syrup. Uh, so they were able uh, to produce high fructose corn syrup. Uh, and that uh, led to an easily accessible source of sugar. Uh, Richard Nixon then began corn subsidies, farm subsidies that we still can't wean ourselves off of. Uh, as a country, uh, which made a, a cheap, readily accessible uh, source of sugar. The third thing that happened was uh, the, the Surgeon General under Richard Nixon uh, was charged with trying to figure out what the deal was with obesity in the, in the United States, because uh, the United States did have uh, an obesity problem. Uh, sugar was already beginning to become a, a bigger part of her diet. Well, they said... Uh, obesity is due to the consumption of fat. And so we're going to strike fat from our diet. We want to have an America that has uh, a relatively fat-free diet, which is why skim milk uh, became a thing and, and they started taking fat out of foods, processed foods. But if you eat, like, say, a, a cracker that doesn't have any fat in it, it really just tastes like cardboard. Uh, and what they did to replace the fat that was removed from the American processed food uh, diet was to replace it with sugar. Um, so uh, the, because uh, they didn't really in the 70s understand the relationship, they didn't really have all the biochemistry worked out and understand what was going on in the liver. Uh, it's, it's really the liver that's, that's doing it. But the connection between uh, uh, high consumption of fructose uh, in absence of the dietary fiber that fructose was uh, traditionally found in. I mean, we eat fructose, right? People eat fructose, but you find it in fruits, and it comes with a huge amount of dietary fiber, which has a different impact on the body than drinking, consuming uh, pure fructose. Anyways, uh, so there's like fructose consumption skyrocketed, refined sugar skyrocketed, uh, and diabetes mellitus skyrocketed. Uh, metabolic syndrome skyrocketed, obesity, cancer, all kinds of fun things. No, not fun at all. Uh, so <clears throat> if you do have diabetes mellitus, uh, there are uh, a lot of, uh, you're at higher risk of, of a number of different health uh, problems. You have a two to four times risk of ischemic heart disease and stroke. Uh, that, you know, is a chicken and the egg thing there, are those running together as a larger uh, suite of uh, symptoms in metabolic syndrome. Uh, people who have unmanaged type 2 diabetes are at a much higher risk of uh, limb amputations than the general population. Uh, you also have a lot of uh, peripheral uh, peripheral vascular disease because of what's called glycation, which is an interesting story. I'm not going to tell you uh, about uh, due to the high level of sugar in your blood, but that leads to uh, blindness and hearing loss and, and kidney failure. Um, and these people, again, because of their peripheral vascular problems, they have dementia, they have impotency, impotent, impotency, sexual dysfunction, um, and then, and they, and they die young. So, uh, it's, it's a real health problem that needs to be dealt with. Uh, there is this thing, uh, gestational diabetes. So, uh, this is a real thing for, uh, to think of, uh, for, for women, uh, about one in 20 to one in 10, uh, pregnancies, the women, um, develop some degree of, uh, diabetes during their pregnancy. Pregnancy 
potentiates this. And, and often it resolves itself after uh, po postpartum, after the baby is born, uh, but it can, uh, it can persist. Uh, it's more likely to persist in subsequent, uh, subsequent pregnancies. So diabetes mellitus, yeah, interesting. Not going to get a chance to talk about it that much, except I like the numbers. The numbers. Um, here is uh, some admittedly old. I need to uh, update some of these uh, statistics here. But uh, 25.8 million children and adults in the U.S. have diabetes. That's 8.3% of the population. 8.3% of the population. It's a lot. That's one, uh, it's, it's about one in 12 people right there. Um, and 18.8 million uh, are diagnosed. They estimate that there's 7 million undiagnosed. But this is what is truly frightening. There are 79 million uh, people who are estimated to be pre-diabetic. Um, so that means people who have risk factors that are showing uh, uh, reduced glucose sensitivity. Um, anyways, so uh, 1.9 million new cases diagnosed in people aged 20 years and older in 2010. This has a tremendous economic uh, impact on the United States. $218 billion cost, $218 billion cost in the United States alone. That's a lot of money, folks. That's a huge amount of, of money. I mean, our GDP is only $19 trillion or whatever. So, I mean, that's a significant percentage of the, of the GDP of the United States. Um, and uh, in, so globally... In 1985, there were 30 million people, uh, and now, and, well, not now, I guess 10 years ago, uh, there were 285 million. So not only is this an American problem, but America is exporting this problem. America is exporting this problem uh, in terms of the American diet. Um, so I, it's really uh, not just a problem uh, of economic here, but it's uh, an economic you know, impact on broad swaths of, of the world. So, um, yeah, the world average was 28.23%. Uh, the prevalence of diabetes worldwide in 2000, per 1,000 inhabitants, uh, was uh, 28.23. I guess that's no per 1,000 confused as to what that statistic means there. But uh, I think that's all I have to say. Are there any comments, thoughts, meditations? Okay.